Romans chapter 8, uh, while you're turning there, it's good to be in God's house tonight. And um, uh, Sister Betty Forsyth called me just a little while ago, and uh, she was catching her breath. She said that uh, the neighbor, actually this neighbor lady came to church a couple Sundays ago with her. And I can tell this lady loved the Lord, and she was just sweet as pie, but... Uh, she took Betty to a doctor's appointment today and come back to Sister Betty's house. They walked inside, was going to do something. Next thing she hears, her neighbor tumbling down her basement steps. Boom, 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 down 14 steps. Instantly her wrist swelled up. So she called an ambulance and they came, got her, took her to St. Anthony's. The lady's two daughters are there with her. And uh, so you girls... Have Rose, her name is Norma, and maybe we can get, I told Betty to call me tomorrow, let me know how she's doing, we'll send her a get well card through Betty Sunday, alright? And, uh, but she was, she's a sweet lady, and she just enjoyed the service, and she knew the Bible, and that's, that's neat, and um, so we're going to pray for Norma tonight, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have a list of people to pray for here in a little bit. But uh, Romans chapter 8, it's good to see you tonight. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. And uh, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. It's good to have the Spirit of God in you. And the Spirit of God, I mean, there's so many things. We covered it last Wednesday night. But he, He's our guide. He's the one that tells us we ought to be doing this. We ought to be doing that. Tells us when we're doing right, blesses us. We get blessings when we do things that are right. And he comes crashing down on us when we ain't right. And I like it that way. I need my guilt. Even over things that I know have been forgiven by God long time ago, I still need my guilt. Keeps us, keeps us on our knees, keeps us humble. You start thinking... You start judging people. When you feel good, I feel good this week, and you start, you start judging people. You start looking down your nose at them. And then all the Holy Ghost has to do is remind you of the pit that He literally drug you out of. And when He set your feet, that's what we sang tonight, He set my feet on the rock to stay. So He set your feet on that rock. And then you remember that and you don't judge people no more. You pray for them. That's what you're supposed to do. So Romans chapter 8, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. It's good to be with you tonight. It's good to be here. And uh, Lisa and I are going on a little road trip tomorrow. And so you pray for us. We'll be back Saturday, so you pray for us. We'll be here Sunday, all right? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus that died for us. Jesus that loved us. To come down here to live like us and to be part of us. And to know what it's like to feel pain, to suffer death, to suffer the death of loved ones. When Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. That's the most profound verse in the Bible. Because it tells us he really cared. And even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he's weeping. It is death hurts father we pray lord for the families that have suffered loss these past few weeks and we pray dear god that you'd bless those and uh father we pray that you bless us tonight we thank you for the holy spirit uh being our guide the holy spirit taught us to come to church tonight and taught us to listen to your word and teaches us your word and says to us what your word is saying to us and and then tells us what to do with our lives when we leave this place tonight and i pray dear god that uh, everybody that is here listening tonight would listen to the holy ghost tell them what to do when they leave here lord i have no power in my words at all but your word has all the power in it and i pray dear god that that power would be available in our lives just bless us and guide us as we study your word tonight and give us, give us awakening, dear God, to your word, to your spirit. Just bless, uh, Father, we pray that you bless Sister Betty's uh, neighbor and her friend. 
And Father, she just felt so bad that happened at her house. And Father, we know you have a reason for everything that you do. We don't understand it, but maybe by and by we will. And we pray, dear God, that you give Sister Betty peace and that you'd bless Sister Norma. And Lord, it was a good to meet her. We pray, God, that you'd just visit with her tonight and ease her of her suffering. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Uh, last week, we kind of focused two chapters in John, or three chapters, John 14, John 15, John 16, described for us the Holy Ghost calling him the Comforter, telling us that he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And that's the world. The Holy Ghost does more than just operate in the lives of Christians. The Holy Ghost operates outside of the world. When people do things that are wrong and they feel bad about it, that's the Holy Ghost working in them. Now, they may never respond to the gospel, but that's still the work. And that's what he said. He's to reprove the world of sin. But now to the believer, to the believer in Jesus Christ, and you've heard me say that verse, there's now therefore no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ Jesus is like Noah being in the ark. We are saved by being in Christ. And there's no danger. There is no danger. So the Holy Ghost then, to those who are in Christ, this is how their life is. This is something that when you read this, you ask yourself the question, am I saved? Am I right with God? Is my heart right with God? Because then he, he gives you qualifications of what the Holy Ghost does in a person's life. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, so the condemnation used to be on you as a sinner. Now you've come in to Christ. Now the condemnation, you've been removed out of the seat of condemnation, put in the seat of righteousness, and Christ has taken your place to be condemned under the law in your place. That's what it means if God is for us. He was in our place. So now that we are in Christ, and then it gives the qualification who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You walk not after the flesh. You still have the flesh. And I'm not saying that now you'll never sin. What I'm saying to you is what God says in Psalm 32, that if you are a godly person and you do fail, you are on your face before God, repenting of that failure, and asking God to remove you from that failure, remove you from the scene of that, remove you from the lifestyle of that, to get you away from that. And I know, I, I, you know, I hear a while back, I was talking about people with addictions, and I still have something I'm working on uh, to, to help people with that. But people who have addictions, whether it's drugs or alcohol or anything like that, they have a lifestyle that where they get hooked in these things. You don't just walk out of that overnight and say, well, God heals me. And so I'm just going to pretend I'm healed and then think everything's going to be OK. It's not. Maybe God does do that every now and then with people on certain things. But it's my experience in salvation, living for God. Not everything does God do overnight. It is a continual work of God. But let God continue to do the work, amen? Be in Christ so He can do the work, and you're following after the Spirit of God. My thing on this, on Romans 8, 1, and I'm going to make a case for it a few Wednesday nights down the road, like I did with Jesus and the Bible, I'm going to lay out a case for the Holy Spirit and the Bible are the same. If we believe that the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and I think John said it that way for a reason, these three are one, then we believe then that the Holy Ghost does not ever speak outside of the Bible. And if God's, and if the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you and you want to know whether it's the Holy Ghost or not, go read your Bible. Make sure that God is leading. Make sure there's two witnesses, three witnesses to it from the Word of God. I have a pastor friend that 
was, was, he was in evangelism and wasn't sure if God was going to lead him out of evangelism. And there was a church that wanted him to pastor and he kept turning them down, kept turning them down. He said, I'm in evangelism. He finally, they kept calling him back to preach and he said, I'll preach, but I'm not going to be a candidate to be, pa-. well, he started praying. God, if you want me to do this, show it to me in the Bible. And he said he'd, he'd wake up in the middle of the night. God just tell him to pray and he would be praying for this church, praying for them to find a pastor. And he just found himself waking up every night, middle of the night, praying for this church. Finally, he's reading, and Paul's talking about Philippians, where he said, I've been in prayer for you day and night. And he said, that was it. And he pastored that church for eight years, and God blessed him there. Okay? But he, it was, he said, God, if, you go, if you're going to show it to me, you show it to me in the Bible. Now, how does God say, go to such and such church in the Bible? But God always sets it up how he's going to show it to you. This book is a miracle book. It's got mir- it's full of miracles in it. If you don't believe it, read it. Amen. Amen. Uh, an old friend of mine came by to get my book by divine order. And I said, now I've got more books. He said, no. He said, we got a new pastor. And he said, I'm hoping to steer him right. And it's about the King James, Brother George. He said, I'm hoping to get him maybe steered in the right direction. So anyway, we'll, we'll pray about that. But here's the thing. Who walk, do this, who walk not after the flesh, but after the, let's say Bible, spirit and the word. These, these are one. So who walk not after the flesh, but after the word of God, the spirit of God, the words that I speak, they are spirit. So think, think that when you're reading this. To walk after the Spirit means to walk in accordance with biblical guidelines ruling your life. Biblical guidelines. This means that you don't get to set up your own set of rules of what you will and will not do. It is God who establishes the rules. It is God who establishes the way of life. It is God who establishes what He will, what he will put up with, what He will not put up with out of you. It is God who, who then warns you, just like a parent warning a little child, if you go over there, I'm going to whip you. Well, what do little children do? They go over there. And what does God do? He whips them. Because God's not going to tell you that and then not do it. Like most parents I know, He does it. But he's told you in his word that he was going to do that. And that's how he's going to do that. He's going to operate. Your life is going to be operated. If Jesus coming here to do it by the book was good enough for him, it's good enough for y'all and me. Amen. So verse two. For the law. Now, now notice how verse two connects what I just said to you for the law of the spirit. What is the law of the spirit? John, what is the law of the Spirit? It's the Bible. That's what that is. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The New Testament made you free from the Old Testament. That's what that just said to you. And he's talking about the, if he's talking about the law of sin and death, obviously he's talking about the Old Testament. And what's written down, so he's then talking about the New Testament, the law of life and the spirit of Jesus Christ, making me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. And again, I use this analogy, stop signs do not make people stop, do they, Cubby? Cubby gave me a negative. Like he's holding his a negative, a 10-4. It does, stop signs do not make people stop their cars. Speed limit signs do not make people limit their speed. Anti-drug policies do not make anti-drug people. People carry urine in their car so they can pass the drug test. Don't they? Oh, I see that all the time on live PD. They'll be searching through your car. Yep, there'll be a box of some urine in there. What's that for? So I can pass a drug test? Stupid. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Whose flesh? Yours. 
what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You just shout, get happy. God sent his son so that things hurt him like they do us. 33 years in this world and he suffered as much pain as anybody probably ever has. And he died. 30, young man, 33 years old now to me is young man. I think about that every now and then. I'm going, I'm 53. Jesus died at 33. He was cut off in his prime. But in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, the Bible, the law, the Word. It's all interchangeable. You walk the way God's Word tells you to walk. You, you guideline your life. You put infringements on your own life. Who in here has an alarm clock? Who in here gets up by way of an alarm clock? Who sets the alarm clock for you? You do. You know what you're doing? You're setting a guideline for yourself. Your mommy's not doing it anymore. Your mommy's not doing it for you anymore. Your mommy's not getting you up out of bed with breakfast on the table for you. You are making yourself get up because you have a responsibility to do so. That's adults. That's what grown-ups do. They set guidelines for themselves because they know that there are repercussions for those who don't live in the confines of their... And you're doing it not because you have to, do it because you want to. That's what makes the difference between a saved person and a lost person who is acting saved. A saved person will set boundaries for themselves because they know there are repercussions for those who do not set those boundaries and those guidelines. So um, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So you know what the Bible says. And you just you do it. You come to church Sunday morning, You come to church Sunday afternoon, You come to church Wednesday night. You get up, whatever time you get up in the morning, maybe you're an early morning person, I'm not, so don't ask me to read my Bible early in the morning because it won't do much. But get me woke up a little bit. Some guys do that. I know preachers get up five in the morning. They've been doing it for 50 years of their life. They get up five in the morning, everybody read four, five, six, ten chapters out of the Bible. I'm not that person. But I know I got to read it. I know I got to have it. And it's not just because that's my job, even though that's part of my job. It's because I know I need it. I'm doing this for me because I need it. I want it. This is what I have to do. So that's what that means. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Again, you know, I use this illustration. And Melissa knows what I'm talking about. When we operated our school, we had two types of students. And I called them Old Testament, New Testament students. The Old Testament students, J.R. and Callie and Hope and Isaac and Michaela and all you guys, the Old Testament students, we had to make them do everything. Make them. Check their work. Make them do this. Because they weren't going to do it on their own. And then the New Testament students, they would come in, set their goals, do the goals, score right, pass the test, move on to the next one, and they did it better and faster than everybody else because they said, I got to do it, so I'm going to do it. And you know, you can say, well, they just need to be disciplined more. Maybe so, but there are some kids that, for some people all their life, it takes them a lot longer to learn these lessons. A lot longer than it does other people. We had a girl, I'm not kidding you, we had a student here. She was, without a doubt, the best student we ever had. And I'm not, we'd known her family for years and it doesn't surprise me. They were godly people, but this girl come in and I mean, she nailed it. She was done with her, she was done with her goals and she said high goals every day. She was done with them by 12, 30, 1 o'clock every day and had the whole rest of the day. You know what she'd do? Do more schoolwork. You know what? She got done a year early, something like that. 
Got done high school a year early. Ready to go to college now. She was that way. And then I had students, we had to handcuff them to the desk practically. Get them, do, do, now do the next one now. Do the next, do, read the next sentence now. It may take them longer. God may have to train them a little bit more. But after a while, God either throws in the towel or he says, well done, thou good and faithful child. And God knows. But you do what's right because you want to do it and you want what's right in your life. You need it. So, verse 5. And it says something very simple. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So that's the people that go to parties and bars and watch sinful things on television, listen to sinful music, read sinful books. They're part of this. They pull in all the sinful amusements of the world, the sinful lifestyles. They might, they might go to a church, but they still mind the things of the flesh. Saved people will struggle through it, struggle with it, but they don't want anything. They don't want a part of it. They don't want it. it may take a while to get them completely out, but they're, they're moving out. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What did I just read to you? They that are after the Bible, the things of the Bible. Same idea, same concept. You're reading your Bible. You know what it says. You want what it says. You want that righteousness in your life. You beg God for it every day. God in His own way, in His own time, who continues the work in us, continually does that work in our lives according to His Word. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. That's the road that we were on. But to be spiritually minded, to be biblically minded, to be word minded is life and peace. And isn't it something to know you have peace with God? God. There's something to be said about that. The joy, it, and it's like you're getting a little bit of the reward here on this earth. And it's not in the form of gold and silver and God just bought me a new house and I have a new... It's none of that. It, the, God told Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. And when you know you've done right and please God and you've minded the things of the Spirit of God, you get imparted into you a little bit, I, I say maybe a little bit more of God, that may not be the right way to say it, but you just feel better. You've got life and peace about you. And that's better than spending your life looking over your shoulder to see if you're going to get caught doing something wrong. Well, if you're not doing something wrong, you don't have to worry about getting caught in it. Okay? And that's what I'm talking about. For the carnal mind is enmity. Verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. So, I mean, we're, you take this now, you apply it to your life only. Somebody wrote me an email today, not today, I, I won't say when, but they wrote me an email and they said, they was asking me for like, there's somebody that they know and they were looking for like a checklist of things to see whether that person was reprobate. And I'm like, I'm not aware of any such checklist where you're supposed to look at somebody else to see whether they are. God already knows whether... and. And then the question was, and if they're reprobate, is there a chance they can be brought back? If they're reprobate, when you get probation revoked, that means the judge said, you're not probationable. You've already proven that you've busted your probation six times. I was with a guy that I knew since childhood in the courtroom, and I have to hand it to the district attorney. 
Because the guy said, I complete, I successfully completed, you know, my drug rehab. And the district attorney said, it's not successful if you keep having dirty drug tests. And I was going, he's right. <laughs> oh my goodness. So they revoked his probation right there. They put him in handcuffs and put him in an orange jumpsuit right then and there. Okay? Because that's what he did. And if you're reprobate, you don't come back. You get seared, your conscience gets seared with a hot iron. You get turned over to a reprobate mind to do that which is unseemly. And God's done with you. I'm not aware of any checklist you're supposed to look at somebody else, but I'm aware of one. I'm looking at one right now where you can apply it to yourself. And don't overlook anything. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And that's my point about our flesh. Our flesh is reprobate. All of ours is. But you're not in the flesh. But in the spirit. And the next word is what? What's the next word? But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If. There is a condition. Upon whom salvation is applied. Don't tell me there's not. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So now that sets up one of the questions that I have. And I brought this up last Wednesday night because I told you I was going to ask it. When do you receive the Holy Ghost? When do you receive the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 9 again. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So there's a doctrine. It's in, it, I won't say it's in all Pentecostal churches, because I don't believe it is. But is, it is in some that say... You are saved, and that's okie dokie. But you don't have the Holy Ghost. And when they say it, it's all one word. Holy Ghost. You don't have the Holy Ghost. Well, why don't you? If you're, if you're saved, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you are not His. So you are not saved. So they actually, and this term comes in, and it's called a second work of grace. It's like you're saved twice now. You're saved, now you're double saved. Because now you, got, you were saved and that's okay, but now you're really saved because you got the Holy Ghost. And that happens sometime later at some festival or some awakening event or some you got slain in the Spirit nonsense or whatever. And that is not how... That is not how the Holy Ghost does it. When the Holy Ghost is ready to enter into you, you become saved right then and there. Right then, if, and read that verse again. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The, there is no difference between the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of life, and peace, there's no difference in that. It's all the one self-same spirit, which is the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. It's Christ and the Holy Spirit abiding in you all at once. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So use these things now to check yourself. Are you carnally minded? That's death. Are you, is your mind and the way it operates at enmity against God or is it seeking to make peace with God? Where is your mind? That's the checklist. Are you walking after the flesh? Are you doing what the flesh is telling you to do? Or are you minding the things of the spirit? Are you carnally minded or are you spiritually minded? Um... Are you in the flesh or are you in the spirit? Does the spirit of God dwell in you? Or is he absent from you 
And you're just pretending. These are things that you are to ask yourself. Nobody can ask that of you. I can't ask, you can't ask it of me. I have to ask it of myself. Am I right with God? Now I'll turn to Romans 10, Romans 8 verse 10. He continues on. And if Christ be in you, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's where he talks about mortifying the, de mortifying the deeds of your body. Mortify what it is that's, that's causing the sin. Or the people that you're with causing the sin. Or the environment that you're in causing the sin. Or whatever is the source of it. Remove yourself from it. Make it dead to you. So it's not there anymore. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And there is a difference between sin and righteousness. Somebody say amen. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. And there's that word if again. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And he's talking about the resurrection. The translation, the rapture, you ca we call it. That's not, you know, it means caught up. It's all the word means. So therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, what will happen to you? You shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, and here's where it is, the Spirit then... Let's say you've got, let's say in your life you've got a list of 30 issues that God's going to deal with throughout the course of your life. Five of them he eliminated when you got saved. You just gave this up. So now there's 25 left. So the Spirit then works on mortifying those things. Killing them off. Teaching you. The Bible's there to teach you how to live righteously. Which is why we have grades in school. You can't teach algebra to first graders. You gotta teach them to add first. Teach them subtract, multiply, divide. Then start getting into a little bit of algebra. But it's not all at once. And we can't expect new Christians to automatically start walking the way we walk. Or the way we think we walk. We can't expect that. So people come in, they get saved and they still got some things that, hey, let's, let's see what God's going to do about that. Let's see how God's going to deal with that. Let's see how God's going to treat that. I've been pastoring a long time and I've seen God work in people where if, if we would have rushed it, it would have ruined it. And in some cases, I may have. In some cases, I may have. But have patience with them while God has patience with them and while God works with them. I mean, I've seen, I remember back years ago, guys started having their hair long. A guy got saved and the first thing he did was went and got a haircut. Nobody told him to do that. He just, Brother George went and got his haircut. He just had a new man in him and a new man said, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. He just felt it. I just, I need to get a haircut. And I had a, I had a guy that got saved and and he had a big bushy beard. He cut that beard off. And I'll be honest with you. He looked better with the beard. He just. I, I don't know. He just felt like he needed to shave the beard. I don't know. But anyway. What I'm saying is. We let God take him through the first grade. Then the second grade. Then the third grade. Then the fourth grade. Then the fifth grade. And then we all get to graduate one of these days. The spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you lived after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, one deed at a time. God's okay. Now God dealt with that. Now you're free on that one. And that next thing God's going to show you. Okay, now we're going to deal on this. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it. I know this because I've experienced it. I've been through first grade, second grade, third grade. Been there, done that. And it still amazes me how God finds things that I didn't know was there. And God says, Mike, that's not right. 
Now I'm going to deal with you on that. Okay, God, I'm ready. So God's working, led by the Spirit. And it, so verse, uh, where was we? Verse 15, through the, ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Now, let me stop right here on this first grade, second grade, third grade thing. Even the United States government realized early on that when a child reaches 16 years old, they have a choice as to whether or not they're going to go back to school. It's their choice. Government will not compel them after 16 to go to school. Because the government recognizes we don't need 30-year-old men still in ninth grade. If they flunked it six times, maybe they're just not going to make it. And I've seen some people kind of go through, hit a point, hit a point, hit a point, hit a point, never get past it, boom. Were they saved? I'm not the judge of that. I'm just telling you, I've seen people come in, I've seen people leave and never come back. So, as many, verse 14, Here's, this, here's your salvation. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are, present tense, right now, the sons of God. That means you're in. You're in. You're a son of God. You're a child of God. And you now stand to be the recipient of the inheritance as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We just don't have the body of it yet. But we're going to get it. And God judges that. God always knows that. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. You see there's, there's your other. There's another answer to the question. When do you get the Holy Spirit? You get it six, eight months after it at a Benny Hinn concert. Or do you get it when God slams you hard down on the pavement and says, I'm going to deal, I'm going to break you until you're broken. And I'm going to work and I'm going to make you a mess until you repent. And I'm going to put godly sorrow in you until you can't stand, until you have no more tears to cry. And then I'm going to release you because I'm going to forgive you of every sin because you're going to beg me for it. That's what God has to do sometimes. Somebody say Amen. And he'll do it, but you're sons of God. And if you're sons of God, you won't despise the chastening. Those who despise the chastening, they're not the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. You are saved, you get the Holy Spirit at salvation. The spirit of adoption. God has signed the document of adoption. It's legal now, and it's been sealed. With the Holy Spirit of promise. Just like an adoption certificate. We've went through that. It gets sealed with a seal. It gets a judge. It gets stamped approval. It's done. It's over with. And it stays that way. The spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry. Abba Father. He's no longer this God who is angry at us all the time. Our minds are not at enmity with him anymore. He is our father and we know it. We know it. He's our father. Courtney, who's your daddy? She knows it. Poor thing. And you got to know it. Catholic Church tells you, you can never know. You can never know from one confession to the next whether you're going to hit purgatory hard or not. You can never know that. God says you can know. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself. And what is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. Turn to, uh, turn to Psalm 82. 
So, and Jesus quoted this passage of scripture. Now, I've been applying it to aliens and stuff like that, but let's apply it to us because Jesus said it. And a, a lady called me and chewed me out over this one time. And I just, and I quoted scripture to her and she bawled me out. Uh, Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. What, what did he say back here? Yet that we are children of God. As children of God. And what that means is, that word gods, means we'll be immortal. Because we're going to be, as the angels, in heaven. That's what Jesus said. That when, and no more marriage. We'll be as the angels in heaven, for they didn't marry nor are given in marriage. And we're going to be immortal, everlasting. But you shall die like men. Now I'm going to die like a man dies. But after that, I'm going to live. In fact, I, I just don't know how quick it is, but I'm pretty sure it's very quick. At the moment somebody draws their last breath, boom, they're alive. How quick is that? That's very quick. Don't ask me to explain it because I haven't experienced it yet. When I experience it, I won't be able to come back and tell you. You'll just have to believe the Bible. But we'll be immortal. We are the children of God. And the Spirit, God's Spirit, His Word. See, when, when, am I the only one who ever doubts? You ever doubt? When I do, I read the Bible. And flush the doubts away. Because I believe this book. I tell myself, Mike, this book is right. And I read it again. Because I need to know. And this Spirit here bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. I'm saved. And I know it. And I'm just, you know, I'm just saying this because I know how it works. When you absent yourself deliberately from the Word of God, it's for a reason. Is it not? When you remove yourself from the Word of God. Is it not for a reason? And not a good reason. When people move away from the Bible. It's not because they don't need it anymore in their walk with God. That's baloney. And I've heard people say. We've moved above having to read our Bible every day. What kind of fruitcake is that? You walk away from this book, you're not walking closer to God, I'll tell you that, because He's right here. It's the power to perform. Romans 15, 19. You're in Romans anyway, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. How is Christ able to do that? Jason Cooley's up there in uh, Minnesota. Uh, and the, and the de you know, the devil attacked him the other day. He, I told you Sunday that the night before he was up preaching at one of these ghost fests or whatever up in Minneapolis. And he's still going, he, it's still going on. So they'll still, he's still working those crowds. He lost his wallet the other day. Has no, and it's gone. And it's like you serve God and the devil punishes you. Some and it he said, it's got me all messed up. He it it puts him now in fear of what else he's forgetting. And I said, Jason, we're pastors. We forget stuff all the time because we so many things running through our minds, so many people, so many issues. We're trying to read the Bible, trying to study for ourselves, trying to study for somebody else. We're worried about so and so, we gotta go here. I said, that happens all the time to me. I forget stuff all the time. And it put him, it put him in a bad place again because he lost his wallet. Now he's got to go through all that process. And that's the devil. You serve God? I'm going to get you. Last time he was out doing it, Sodomite tried to stab him. They arrested, they were, they were looking for the gal that tried to do it. 
It's the devil punishing you for living for God. So if you didn't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you would fold up. You would fold up like a house of cards and say, I'm not doing this. Now forget it. Kenya, I go to Kenya sometimes. They eat me alive over there. And it's not the people. It's the spirits. So how would, and I, Lisa's been with me once. Michael was with me the second time. I was, I was like out of my mind trying to get out of Kenya. Like freaking out. Michael, get me to the airport. I got to get out of here. That bad. And God reminded me what was going on. And I finally calmed down. I said, whatever. And I, I, had, I won't get into the whole story. But anyway, the devil will beat you up. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, everybody falls. God gives you the Spirit to get back up. And you say, you know, a devil, I didn't like that. God, I didn't like that. But if you'll give me the power to get back up, I'll do it again. And I hate saying that, but I'll do it again. That's power. You don't get that power. You don't make that and invent that stuff in your mind. God does it for you. Colossians 1, 11, strengthened with all might. According to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. You see those two words, patience and longsuffering? You see those two words? Those two words we don't like? God telling us to wait. You see that? Yeah, I know you, pr yeah, I know you prayed. Wait. Just wait. Just trust me. Will you tr sit down? Sit. Trust me. That's God to us. Will you trust me? But God, I got to get rid of this. Will you trust me, Mike? Will you trust me? Yeah, I'll trust you. Strengthen with all might. God, finally, listen to me, finally, for the first time in your life, giving you the power to say no to something that before you didn't have the power to say no to. Remember that old song, Somebody's Knocking, Should I Let Him In? Lord, it's the devil. Would you look at him? Right? God's given you the power to say no to something or someone. Whereas before, you didn't have the power to do it. The power of the Spirit. Colossians 1.11, strengthen with all might. For 2 Timothy 1.7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, do not believe then that it's a sin to be afraid. It's not a sin to be afraid. Whoever told you that on Facebook in some stupid meme wasn't telling you the truth. David said, what time I am afraid, I will call on thee. Being afraid comes as part of being in this package. See, when we come riding back with Jesus on white horses, we'll be in spirit bodies and we're not afraid of nothing. But that's not me now. Okay? So he's given us the spirit. And I, I'm telling you this. I am telling it to you. When God is in it, you are not going to be afraid. And I believe that when it's your time to die, you will not be afraid to die. And I also believe, because I want you to listen to me, this world is getting worse. And over, you could, we could wake up tomorrow with a civil war in this country. Do you not understand that? Am I right? And it could all be gone. And you could be like, what am I going to do? I promise you, if God requires of you to shed your blood for his kingdom, you will not be afraid. Daniel wasn't. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not. But we're not talking about three super high spiritual people. We're talking about three boys, four boys. Three young men who said, we believe God will save us, but if not, we're not going to bow to that. And they weren't afraid. Neither was Daniel. He's down there petting lions the next morning. I named this one Cubby. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Lion Cubby, get it? Oh, yeah. Are you, do you, do, so, do you have the Holy Spirit tonight? I'm asking you. Do you have the Holy Spirit tonight? Okay, that's you. You got to know it. You got to know it, okay? So, and next, next Wednesday night, he's going to be your prayer partner. Okay?